Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, as well as the October month-long Pumpkin Playground Festival featuring hayrides and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188. Welcome to Gardening with Burke Nursery, the show where we help you grow your garden and increase the curb appeal of your yard. I'm your host, Misty Kacharis, the horticulturalist at Burke Nursery and Garden Center. One of the best things that I like about my job as a horticulturalist is meeting with scout troops and students who want to learn about creating gardens, especially butterfly gardens. So for those of you who can't join me at the nursery, welcome to today's show where you'll learn how to create butterfly gardens, the spring edition. So thinking about a butterfly garden is like thinking about a simple recipe. You just need actually a few things. You need the right environment. Well, butterflies, they love the sun, so the sunnier the location, especially afternoon sun, is what you're looking for for your garden. They like plants with bright colors. They like blues or purples. They like yellows and oranges. They like reds, anything that really attracts them. And also herbs that attract butterfly larvae such as parsley, is a wonderful thing to be planting. And then, finally, you want some garden art. Garden art for butterflies? Yes, definitely. What you want, and you can get whatever size that you want to get, is these are flat stones. And what you want to do is take flat stones and put them in your butterfly garden in different locations. The reason being is when the butterflies wake up in the morning, they're cold. And they're looking for places to warm their bodies. And these stones during the summer months will actually retain heat so that if they can land on these stones and warm their bodies, they can make it through the day. The other piece of art that is important for your butterfly garden is a simple tray, this little pan. And this one actually is what is usually put at the base of a pot. So I call them pot pans. And inside the pot pans, and I thought about this as I put this sand in here, is maybe if I had taken a green pot pan, you could see it better. Hopefully you can see that right here I have sand and some people, they like to create a zen garden of a little house plant where they use the sand at the base and then they can move it with their fingers reflectively, meditatively. Well, what butterflies do is they like sand or they're looking for mud. And the sand really normally needs to be moist sand. And they like to do what is known as puddling. Puddling means that they just stay in this area. And it's kind of neat to see them. That if you're walking in nature and you see a whole bunch of butterflies in a mud area, what they're doing is called puddling. And they're actually looking for minerals to be able to improve their nutrition. And then finally, when you're creating a butterfly garden, size doesn't matter. So you can plant, as I have here, in a container garden. And you can find annuals that butterflies may like. You can actually plant some perennials in a container. So perhaps at your home, it's one of those areas where you don't have sun anywhere except on your patio or on your deck. 
So container gardens. Or just, I never did measure the table that I'm talking behind, but I would imagine it's six or eight feet by four feet wide. This size can make a wonderful butterfly garden. In another case, I actually have a client who asked me to come to her home and design a butterfly garden in her entire front yard. So that's the important thing. Size doesn't matter. Well, before I continue talking about the types of perennials that will attract butterflies and that you'd really want in your butterfly garden, I'd like to have what I call a little public service announcement. And this public service announcement is called Protect the Swallowtail Butterflies. Now this picture, and the pictures that you'll see are actually pictures that I took when I was raising swallowtails. So this is one of my adults that eventually, as soon as his or her wings were dry, I just released to the wild. And we want to protect these swallowtails. And by the way, the yellow one called the tiger swallowtail is actually the state insect of Virginia. So the next picture that I want to show you may look strange. And it is maybe one inch in length. It is maybe a half an inch wide. It has what looks like a white splash on it and it's actually eating parsley. Now, I put parsley out all over my yard. Why? Because the swallowtail butterflies, when they're babies, they eat the parsley. And this one, believe it or not, this funny looking little insect is actually a baby caterpillar. And so it's getting ready to go into its next stage. And its next stage, is, as you see in this picture, a caterpillar that has yellow and black and little dots on the back. And I call those horizontal, they go, they go around. And again, on my parsley. And just eating the parsley away. And also these caterpillars, when they look like this, they are called parsley worms. And then I invited the parsley worms into my house where I created a butterfly nesting area until the swallowtails emerged. So if you see these insects, if you see this funny looking black insect with what looks like white splashed on its center, or if you see these caterpillars, these parsley worms eating your parsley, they also like dill by the way, so they'll eat your dill. Please don't spray them. Please do everything you can to keep them alive because we need more butterflies. So definitely protect the swallowtails. All right. Thank you very much for the public service announcement. And now what I'd like to do is talk about some perennials that butterflies love and that you will love to have in your garden. And the first most common perennial is known as phlox. We have two types of phlox here, and there's quite a few phlox, but there are basically three important phloxes. This phlox, the subdulata phlox, is actually known as creeping phlox. It's a ground cover. Throughout the entire, it blooms now in the spring, it's not only purple, but you can see it almost as a magenta. Sometimes you see it as white. And one of the things that butterflies love are they love flowers that they can just land on. This flocks here is a little easier to see. Flathead flowers, they can just land on these flathead flowers. Butterflies love that. So that is one of the foxes that we have that this one blooms in the spring, and by the time that it comes midsummer, it basically by the end of May, it stops blooming, but you have a beautiful mound of green. 
and it just gets maybe six inches tall, but it can spread. It can spread two feet wide. And eventually, after three or four years, if you really want to maintain the flocks, you really need to do what we call uh, cut them in half and then divide them. And you would divide them in the spring so that, that that grows much better at that time. Now, the other flocks that we have here is what we call the woodland flocks. So let's give the woodland flocks its, its prominent spot right here. Divericata is the woodland flocks. Forgot to say this, your creeping flocks, <laughs> we're playing back and forth with the flocks here, your creeping flocks likes sun. It likes a lot, a lot of sun. Your woodland flocks, it grows in the woods. It grows in the areas where it can find moist soil. It likes dappled sunlight. It does not like afternoon sun at all. And even then, it's not sure if it totally likes it. So this is more of a shade plant. And both of these phloxes are native to North America. So the only minor problem with this woodland phlox is your little mammals do like to eat it. So no, believe it or not, phlox is deer resistant, but your woodland phlox is not rabbit resistant. Rabbits really like it. They, they, <laughs> they love the foliage. To them, it's like, like lettuce. They just really like it. So there is the phlox. Now the next thing, let me move this a little further back here so that you'll get a better vision of the columbine. Isn't this a beauty? I lived in Colorado for a while and the columbine is the state flower of Colorado and it's a wildflower in Colorado. We also do have the native columbine here on the East Coast as well. What's interesting is the one that's native on the East Coast is actually a red flower, while the one that's native in Colorado is this color, with the blue, with the little bit of white. And this also um, prefers to be in shade. It is a woodlands plant. It is native to the United States, and so you get the lavender color, you get the blue color, you get the yellow color, and not only do butterflies like this, but hummingbirds and moths. And when it goes to seed, what's important is that your songbirds really love the seeds of the columbines. The one thing about a columbine, though, even though I have it listed as a perennial, it's, tip, it's basically a biannual. What that means is that it, fl it flowers basically every other year. So when you, if you decide to go with columbines, buy some now, then buy some next year, and then they'll constantly reseed and they'll constantly reflower and you won't even know that they're flowering only every other year. But just really a beautiful plant. I highly recommend it. And it does, by the way, <laughs> this is not a short one. This columbine can get up to three feet tall. So one of the things that you may want to consider is putting it further away, maybe closer to the house or closer to a fence because of the height. And since it likes shade, it won't have a problem being by a fence or it won't have a problem being by your house. Now, let's see what's next on my list. And the next one on my list is called a bachelor's button. Again, notice how the flowers are just the purples and 
and the blues and the reds and everything. And the bachelor button, again, if you look at the flower of the bachelor button, you'll see that it is flat. And again, that's what butterflies like. The butterflies like the flat surface. Or, as with the columbine, they prefer, they like tubular as well. There's several different types of bachelor buttons. This bachelor button is a perennial. It's the Centauria Montana. There is a Centauria Sciences, and that one is an annual. Butterflies like both. So if you decide that you find the annual and that's what you want, buy it. Your butterfly will, will be very happy. Bees also love this, especially your small little pollinating bees. As a matter of fact, when I got out of my car to come into the studio, a couple little bees followed me out. They had been on the plants. They just didn't want to leave the plants. And that's all right because those tiny bees are not the bees that sting, so you don't have to worry. And this can also get two feet tall, and it can spread two feet. Did I mention, I may have mentioned, maybe not, this is a full sun plant. It needs six hours or more of direct sunlight. The good thing, because it's such a full sun plant and needs that much sunlight, it is what we call drought tolerant. What that means is that once it establishes, then you don't need to worry about watering it. It's just the first year that it takes to establish any plant, so that's when you want to water it. Now, another plant that butterflies love, hummingbirds love, bees love, you may look at me and go, how is it that they can get nectar from this plant? Well, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but I definitely want to show you this plant and it is called a bleeding heart. Now, a bleeding heart to me is just an incredible plant. As far as the flowers, I remember as a little girl, I was just so fascinated with how the flowers really looked and, and how they could, how anybody could just pollinate them. But I mean, they are called bleeding hearts because they definitely have their little shape here with the hearts and then you have the other coming down. And this particular one is the Spectabilis and the Centra Spectabilis. There are actually several different types of bleeding hearts. And that's the fascinating thing. This particular bleeding heart, which if you didn't know, you might not be able to tell the difference, is not native. This one is actually from Eastern Asia, Northern China, Korea, Japan. And yet there are native bleeding hearts. So the one, Decentra, eczema is the one that is also known as the eastern or fringe bleeding heart and that's native to our area here in eastern North America and then there's the decentra formosa and that's native to the western or the Pacific area of the country and that one especially the formosa is actually a woodland plant now your bleeding hearts do tend to be woodland they like shade, but they don't like deep shade. They like what is known as light shade. What that means is that they're very happy with sun in the morning and a little bit of shade, dappled sun in the afternoon. They'll also tolerate sun, meaning if you have a sunny location and that's the only location you have and you really want to plant them there, they will tolerate that sun so you don't need to worry. 
The first time I saw a bleeding heart was when I visited a friend of mine in Ohio. Never mind how many years ago that was. That was quite a few years ago. But I thought it was a shrub. Her bleeding heart was literally four feet tall by four feet wide. It was amazing, just gorgeous. And to see all the flowers, phenomenal, just totally phenomenal. The one thing, though, that you need to be cautious with bleeding hearts, especially if you are in the northern part of our region, like Ohio or Massachusetts or Connecticut, is that sometimes these come up, even though these are considered a spring, early summer blooming plant, they actually are slow when they come up. And so what happens is they die back fully. And then as they slowly come up, you see these little red things start poking from the ground. And it doesn't even look like it's going to become a bleeding heart. So what happens is that a lot of the people that have bleeding hearts the first year may actually dig them up thinking that they're not thinking, they don't realize they're digging them up. What's happening is that they're waiting for them to come up. They're not coming up in the person's mind because they're a little slow. And so the person thinks, oh, I need to plant something else in this location. And they'll, that's when they'll dig them up and plant something else. And they've missed out on another wonderful season of bleeding hearts. So it's very important to give the bleeding heart time to just find its way into your world. And they'll be thankful that you did that. And then finally, I would like, unfortunately, the nepeta, unfortunately, this particular plant is not flowering right now, but this is a plant, cat mint, not catnip, but cat mint. And this is a plant that I highly recommend. Some cats like it. Some cats could care less about cat mint or catnip. That's a whole nother thing. And this one is known as the junior walker. And the reason it's known as the junior walker is most of your cat mint, like catnip, can just grow out of control. But this has been created as a cultivar so that it will basically contain itself. It only stays about 12 to 24 inches, and it gets incredible blue flowers. But this also is one of the greatest attractors of pollinators, not only your butterflies, but also the bees, and not only your bumblebees, but all sorts of small native bees. And one day I was looking at mine, and it looked like I had little blue gemstones all over the plant. And those little blue gemstones were shimmering in the sun, and they were actually bees. And a lot of people happen to think that those bees were flies, but they weren't. They were bees pollinating not only my plant, but also going and pollinating everything in my garden. So I highly recommend that you get yourself a cat mint for your garden. And as we start wrapping up this show, I would like to take a brief moment to talk about a couple of annuals that are also very wonderful for your butterfly garden. And that's the annuals that I actually have here in this little container. So let me move this Nepeta catmint out of the way. My favorite annual is definitely the Lantana. This one actually, this is the orange and the red one, sometimes called ham and eggs. 
And a new cultivar of this lantana came out a few years ago wh where the flowers were pur are purple, gorgeous. Butterflies love this. Hummingbirds love it. You can put this on your deck. You can put this by your door and the hummingbirds will come. They don't care. And then of course, your daisies. Always, daisies are always wonderful for butterflies. And then finally, your sweet alyssums. And they're called sweet because the fragrance is just amazing. Well, these are just some of my favorite spring blooming plants that will attract butterflies to your garden. And if you have any questions about creating a butterfly garden, just contact me at misty at burknursery.com. I'm your host, Misty Kacharis, and I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me here at Gardening with Burke Nursery. I'm looking forward to helping you grow your garden. Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, as well as the October month-long Pumpkin Playground Festival featuring hayrides and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188.